Good afternoon. I'm Sheriff Nadia Gonzalez III. Uh, we're here to uh, conduct our briefing or debriefing on our deputy involved shooting. Uh, but be, before we get started, I just wanted to uh, take a moment and uh, recognize the New Mexico State Police officer that died last week, Darian Jarrett. Uh, acknowledge his family. Uh, let, let them know, let the New Mexico State Police uh, Chief Robert Thornton and their agency know that uh, we're praying and thinking about them. And, and we just wanted to take just a really quick moment to uh, uh, maybe uh, take a silence, uh, a moment of silence and, and just recognize those officers. Okay, uh, so moving on to our deputy involved shooting. Uh, last week, um, January 31st at about 11.18 p.m. at the 1000 block of Atrisco Drive Southwest, we uh, had deputies dispatched to an armed subject. Uh, when they received that call, the call coming in, uh, there, was, there was a fight that ensued there at the 1000 block. At least two rounds were fired and two males were involved in that fight. They uh, received updates, and the updates they received is a physical description of that person, and that person was eventually left the home. Uh, apparently, that person that was on the scene that was fighting over this gun at least fired two rounds towards the building. We had an unrelated call that two deputies were at. It was a non-priority call, and they were in the range of listening to that call come in, but they also heard there's those gunshots. Those deputies responded. There was two of them. Two, the two deputies that were involved were Deputy John, Jonathan Scraw and Deputy Lorenzo Herrera. En route to the call, they both activated their cameras by this device. It's a Bluetooth uh, device. It was self-initiated by the two deputies. When the deputies were approaching the scene, they came into contact with that person, fitting that description that was given over radio. They engaged their emergency equipment, and as they exited their vehicle, they tried to make contact with that individual. When they tried to make contact with that individual, they gave him some verbal commands. He did not comply with any of those verbal commands. He fled on foot at about the 1100 block of Atrisco Southwest. He jumped the fence into somebody's private property and began to run. Our deputies gave chase. They ran through the yard and somewhere in the backyard, that subject who was later identified as Ezekiel Mesa, he was 41 years old. He discharged his, a weapon that he was holding. Our deputies, in return, fired back numerous times. I don't know how many times until they were able to have Mesa stop taking his deadly actions. After that, the deputies rendered aid. Rescue arrived on scene, and he was pronounced dead on, on the scene. I just want to give you a little bit of background about Ezekiel Mesa's extensive arrest history, dating back to 1995. With 19 arrests and charges including felony, felon in possession of a firearm, battery and assault on a household member, trafficking narcotics, probation violations, battery upon a peace officer, resisting, evading, and obstructing. I also just want to mention and send my condolences to Mesa's immediate family. I have two captains with me today. They'll be covering two different areas of this press conference. Uh, to my left is Captain Huffmeyer. He's going to be covering any questions that you have on the body-worn device, because he's in charge of that program. And to my right is Captain Funes, and he'll handle any questions that you have further on the investigation that we can answer. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to 
Captain Huffmeyer because he's going to be covering and debriefing you on the uh, on the uh, video coverage. And I apologize. If you could go back one slide. Uh, Deputy Scraw is one of the deputies that was involved in the incident. One year, two months with the BCSO. He just graduated from our last academy. So he's basically been out in the field for about six months. The second person involved in the shooting was Deputy Lorenzo Herrera out of the same academy, one year, two months. Uh, so he was a second deputy involved. They're both in administrative leave, leave at this time. And uh, I'm going to turn this over to Captain Huffmeyer. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, everybody can hopefully get both myself and the, the screens because we are going to be playing some video footage. Uh, but before we view these video segments, there's a few pieces of information that we think are critical that the public know. And we're grateful that you're here to help us get that information out to them. First, and this is plainly stated in our policy, uh, our body-worn camera policy rather, is that the footage you're about to see is only one piece of a larger investigation. That includes witness interviews, direct testimony of the deputies involved, and then obviously the footage. In fact, in this case, we have the benefit of having two body-worn camera videos, which as uh, was mentioned earlier, you'll be given a copy of. But in addition to that, we have surveillance footage from the yard where the shooting incident actually took place. That's private residence surveillance footage that those individuals provided to us. Um, in the interest of time today, we're going to be showing you several items. First thing that you're going to see and hear is the 911 call that was placed to our dispatch center. Second, you're going to hear radio communications that were recorded between our dispatchers and the responding deputies. Third, you're going to see body-worn camera footage from the deputy closest to the suspect during the encounter. And fourth, you're going to see the previously referenced surveillance footage from the yard that I just talked about. Um, after we view the footage from start to finish, because we're going to watch it in its entirety uninterrupted, um, I will go over in slightly more detail and, and in slow motion some of the footage that's taken from the surveillance video in the yard gives you a, a more of a bird's eye view of what took place in the incident. Um, but regardless of the footage that we show you today, what I want to illustrate is that in these investigations, it's the perception of the deputy at the time that is the most critical. Um, and we utilize that perspective when we evaluate the objective reasonableness of any use of force incident. There is no camera that completely captures that perception. Frame rates, viewing angles, lighting, and the exact direction that a camera is facing at the time are all limitations of any body-worn camera system. But we are grateful to have this footage and to be able to show it to you today is, is a wonderful thing in the interest of community trust and transparency for our agency. So let's, let's go ahead and show that. Thank you. 
So you can keep on the screens there. I'll just narrate over, over it as we go along here. So what you're going to see in this footage as it rolls is you're going to see the suspect and deputies come into view as they're engaged in an active foot chase. Right here as the suspect goes to the ground, what you see is what appears to be a muzzle flash as the suspect falls and the muzzle flash backwards in the direction of the deputies that are giving the foot chase. Next, you see the reaction from the deputies who exchange gunfire with the suspect. Then you see very plainly a second muzzle flash directly towards the deputies who are engaged in the foot chase. They stop and finally, then you see the deputies move to a position of cover and tactical advantage. And it's from that point where they conduct the other logistical business of handling a call like this, calling for medical support notifying supervision, other dispatch communications that are necessary in a critical incident like this. Um, that is what is plainly shown on the video. You'll be provided with a copy of it and that'll conclude the video presentation portion and I thank you for, for taking the time to, to watch that with us and now I believe we're going to open it up for some questions uh, directed to the sheriff. So, anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, can you talk about when the decision is made to use deadly force? Uh, you kind of laid it out nicely in that video about what happened, but why deadly force is needed or uh, administered in a situation like this? I'm going to hand that back off to the uh, captain. Sure. That that's. I'm hesitant to to get into hypothetical questions about force usage. Uh, I can tell you that. The landmark Supreme Court case law dictates when uh, force should be utilized. The objective reasonableness standard outlines that very specifically. So I can't really answer a hypothetical. I can just tell you that I think the video speaks for itself. And in this circumstance, it'll be the job of the criminal investigators and the district attorney's office to determine whether or not it's objectively reasonable. But how about the policy of DCSO? I mean, that, that's not hypothetical. Almost exactly what I just said, sir, is what our policy states. Okay. I don't have those details, but I can um, hand this off to the captain because he's more intimately involved with the investigative part of this. You're, you're accurate. There was a bullet that was recovered from the residence on the property that the incident took place. And that bullet was from uh, 38 Special, which was used by the suspect. The, uh, where the round was found was behind where the deputies were standing and in, into the house. So it wasn't Yes. It seemed like the suspect had a, a very lengthy criminal record. Uh, how how dangerous is it, is it to have uh, people that maybe have not served their full prison time out on the streets and then we have an incident like this? Extremely dangerous. I mean, uh, we can go back to just last week and uh, across the nation, most of these people have the propensity for violence. They have extensive uh, criminal records. 
and I think it's concerning to every citizen, especially the ones that live here in our county and uh, this city, that it's a, it's a huge issue. Uh, we, the people of this county, the people of this city want people to be held accountable. If not, the last thing we want to have to do is take deadly force action out, at, out in the public to have to remedy these situations because they're very uh, stressful, uh, not only for our deputies, but for the public. And obviously I know Elisa kind of uh, uh, mentioned that she had spoke to the, the residents, but they have their concerns. So it puts everybody at risk. And I think the best thing to do is maybe consider uh, some of these more violent people uh, to hold them in custody or hold them accountable and give them their, their sentencing that they uh, rightfully deserve. Are you grateful that we had the body worn cameras in this instance? We know the you know the long story of getting them at Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department, and and uh, they are one tool to show that. And it seems it was the other camera that wasn't even the body worn that showed the, the best picture. But are you grateful that we have this tool to to show transparency and what your deputies go through? I, I look at this as, uh, and, and I'm glad you asked this question. It's not the the magic potion that everybody was thinking it was going to be. It's another piece in the puzzle. And so for us, we know that nothing will ever take the place of a thorough investigation. But what I will tell you is that uh, we're learning from this and there's value in this. And we're looking at everything from training uh, because when we're looking at it from the eyes of a law enforcement officer, we're looking at a different perspective. But it could assist us in an administration, administrative investigation. And I think there's a lot of value. So uh, I'm not opposed to that and I'm, I'm uh, embracing the technology and we're just seeing how much further it can take us. But again, I don't think it was a magic potion everybody thought it could be in these investigations, but it is another piece of the puzzle. What have you learned or what have you, you learned from this incident of seeing camera? Uh, I can tell you that it vindicates my thoughts about my trust in the deputies that I've always had. It's never changed. Uh, we had recorders be before now we just have something to add to that. So if I'm learning something, uh, I'm looking at it from, like I said, an administrative standpoint, a training standpoint, a way to mitigate things, but also another way to keep the people safe. So in that instance, I'm, I'm embracing it to figure out where it's gonna take us. So it's, we're just in the infancy stage of this camera program. So I'm looking forward to what it has to offer in the future. Yes. Can you talk about how it worked? You said it was activated. What were like the logistics of how it turned on? And, and I don't know, was it, was it more of a chest? Was it the cell phone that you showed us in the past? How did it, it work? So in this case, it's remotely activated. It's pressed and then it's activated. The point I wanted to make with this is that it just goes to show you the integrity of our deputies. And in the event they would have maybe be caught like maybe the state police officer that was shot in his vehicle maybe it would have been activated when they turned on their emergency equipment. So you have that footage. What I like about the technology is it removes the burden of that being placed on the deputy. It's, there's other ways to activate it. When they turned on their emergency equipment, it came on. If when they started running, it would have been action activated. And if not, if all those didn't fail in the split second decision, when he removed that hol his gun from his holster, it would have been activated. So we have so many more options that remove that doubt about what they're doing, but more importantly, it's keeping the deputy safe. And that's what I'm concerned about. And it's keeping, if it keeps the public safer, then I'm all in, and we are all in. So thank you. Anyone else? Would you like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand that off to the captain. Uh, in, my, in my prior job, I, I did a lot of extensive training work. I, I can tell you every scenario, even the ones that we had that were only audio recordings, we can make use of those because I don't think anything can replicate a real life scenario that we can take and learn from. Having the video gives us a tremendous amount of information. I mean, in this case, you have the two body worn camera videos and they're being jostled around as they're running. So the, the clarity comes and goes depending on the movement of the person wearing the camera. We have the, the fortune of, of having the surveillance camera from the yards so that gives us a bird's eye view. We're not always gonna have that and we know it, but when we do have it, we can utilize it. So it gives us an ability to evaluate tactics. We're not here to Monday morning quarterback people. I wasn't in that scenario and I can't say exactly how I would have reacted, but we can use it 
to modify training scenarios. I mean, our deputies go through a two-week officer survival block in the academy where they're subjected to tens of scenarios. Sometimes in some academy classes, 50 plus scenarios of real world uh, role playing scenario based training. And we can incorporate these kinds of videos and these scenarios to create new versions of, of old scenarios to revamp them. So it just gives us a lot of, of information and data to, to work with that we wouldn't have had before. Yes. And are they both still at administrative Yes. Okay. Do you remember when those came back? Uh, I'm we can follow up with you at a later time. I'll take one more question. Uh, can you just, I don't know, maybe articulate, I mean, when we've had the state police death that you alluded to at the beginning of the program, the danger that deputies face, whether we see it every day or not? Well, I don't know if I'm going to articulate, but what I'll tell you as a matter of fact is that there's so many people wa uh, walking out there that are dangerous to, to the public, is at some point we're going to have to make a decision of, of holding those people accountable. And that isn't just coming from me, that's coming from the public sentiment. So to me, I think we need to listen to the people and what they want. And if that's what they want, then we need to hold these people accountable. I have my concerns for the deputies and we're always gonna offer them what we can in terms of resources, support, uh, training, uh, whatever we can do to keep them safe. But we need uh, the rest of the criminal justice system to work also. I'm going to just make one more uh, uh, point before we leave, and that's uh, uh, another technology thing we're going to roll out tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to do one of our uh, grip-offs that we're going to be doing in the southeast part of town. If you want to go, you're more than willing to, to go to the briefing. What we're going to roll out tomorrow is our live stream from our, our helicopter, and that's like a real-time crime center. What we're going to do for a period of about four hours is give the opportunity for the public to view our operations via the helicopter. And so we're gonna have the ability to live stream that onto a, uh, a device coming from a smartphone. But the beauty of it is if you have a, a smart TV, you can put that on the, your television and we will give you a live view of what we're doing and one of our operations tomorrow that take place in Albuquerque. And so we'd invite you, uh, we're trying to get that out. If you wanna send that message out, uh, we'd invite you to take the opportunity, uh, but make sure you try to show up tomorrow, okay? All right. Uh, okay, I, I appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you.